in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to the last of our midday meditations. During Holy Week, we have journeyed with different companions of Jesus. We have heard the events that unfolded during those last days of his life from their point of view. Today, we accompany Jesus to the cross. I invite you to enter into our time of prayer and meditation with open minds and open hearts, that we may allow the events of Good Friday to speak to us in a new way, that as we stand at the foot of the cross, we might realise afresh the incredible truth that Jesus died for all. We begin by praying the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now Christine will read us our meditation. Today we accompany Jesus to the cross. Companions on the way. It was on a Friday morning that they led me from my cell. I could see they had a carpenter to crucify as well. You can blame it all on Pilate. You can blame it on the Jews. You can blame it on the devil. But it's God that I accuse. It's God they ought to crucify instead of you and me. As I said to the carpenter, a hanging on the tree. You can blame it all on Adam. You can blame it all on Eve. You can blame it on the apple, but that I can't believe. It was God that made the devil and the woman and the man. And there wouldn't have been an apple if it wasn't in the plan. Yes, it's God they ought to crucify instead of you and me. As I said to the carpenter, a hanging on the tree. Companions, the word means literally with bread. Those with whom you share bread and therefore by implication the ordinariness and the necessities of life. We use it in a gentle way to mean people with whom we do things from sharing a flat to sharing a car. There were two others to be crucified that day with Jesus. Can you use the word companions? For those who are forced into each other's company, not of their choosing. Do you remember that text? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. St Luke gives us a later conversation between these three. One bitterly attacks Jesus and his apparent impotence to do anything constructive, despite his claim to be Messiah. What's the point of being a Messiah who can't come up with the goods when the heat's on? Cynical, bitter, just as I fear I might be in his shoes. The other one rebukes the first, acknowledging his own culpability and Jesus' innocence. This is the ideal voice of faith responding to suffering with confession and trust in God, and then acting in response with faith that Jesus can still effect future hope for him. That's the other end of the spectrum where I would like to think I might be if I suddenly found myself in that dark place of shadow. And Jesus rewarded his faith with promise and hope. But we will all walk this valley of the shadow of death sooner or later. We will all come somewhere along that spectrum between cynical and bitter and repentant and full of faith. But note 
that in both these cases the Lord was with them. These three very different men walked the valley of the shadow of death together that day, two of them little knowing how very really God was with them. One, we are told, was gathered up into the heavenly realm. The other, we're not told what happened to him, and we cannot know. We do know that he was hung up and he died in the company of God himself. But wait, we are rushing ahead. Let's return to that procession of death from the city out to the place of the skull, for there's a fourth man there. He'd come up from the country, from North Africa. Was he a businessman, a traveller? He's in the front of the crowd where the Roman soldier could pick on him. Why is he there? Is this the curiosity that nearly killed the cat? Perhaps he's in the crowd and he's seen the people gathering, pushed his way to see the spectacle and got more than he bargained for. It may be possible that he'd heard of Jesus, seen him before. Even if he was a secret believer, he still got more than he expected. For there is no glamour here, no sense of destiny. There is only the sudden involvement by force, the cross laid on his back, the sudden command from the Roman soldier, follow the prisoner and the threat if he disobeyed. Who was he, this stranger with his 15 minutes of fame? He was an African. Was that why, why he was pulled out of the crowd? Pick on the one that's different. Some might say that nothing changes. And after he'd carried out the task and was then ignored, did he slink off as fast as possible or wait a while? We don't know, but there's a little bit of information from Mark's Gospel that's very telling. He describes him as Simon from Cyrene, the father of Rufus and Alexander. Well, that's a meaningless detail unless Rufus and Alexander were known to Mark's readers. And indeed, a Rufus turns up in one of Paul's letters. Oh, we hope, don't we, that all this could fit neatly together. But we have no concrete proof. Only the story of a black guy called Simon, who was press-ganged by the Romans into doing what Jesus asks all of us to do freely. Take up the cross and follow me. And that cross burdened Simon in the valley of the shadow of death too. It's not only our own deaths that take us there, but the deaths of others with whom we are keeping company, and the death of a saviour who asks us to help him carry the weight of caring for others, the suffering and the loss. This valley is a dark one, but the Lord is with me. Oh, so truly is the Lord with me every time I enter it. He is my companion, just as Simon from Cyrene was his. It's God they ought to crucify instead of you and me. And they did. God did not hold himself aloof from the sufferings of his creation, but entered into its reality and sanctified it by his very presence. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Amen. The Nail Man by Steve Turner Which one was it who held the nails and then hammered them into place? Did he hit them out of anger or a simple sense of duty? Was it a job that had to be done or a good day's work in the open air? 
and when they slid past bone and bit into wood, was it like all the others? Or did history shudder a little beneath the head of that hammer? Was he still there, packing away his tools, when it is finished was uttered to the throng? Or was he at home, washing his hands and getting ready for the night? Will he be among the forgiven on the day of days, his sin having been skewered by his own savage spite? Drop, drop, slow tears, and bathe those beauteous feet, which brought from him the news and prince of peace. Not wet eyes, his mercy is to entreat to cry for vengeance, sin doth never cease. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, your body was broken for us. You endured the agony of the cross to reconcile us to God, to break down the barriers that divide us, to make us one. Help us to recognise that you died not just for some of us, but for all of us. And help us to understand that nothing which keeps us apart can be more important than the truth which binds us together. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.